All right, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We are now, um, and welcome to our Exodus study in chapter 13. Um, we come quite a journey as we've uh, walked through verse by verse up to this point. And last week, we see in verse 50, um, thus all the children of chapter 12, thus all the children of Israel did as Yahuwah commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. And it came to pass that on that same day that Yahuwah brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt according to their armies. And it's interesting to me how in one night they leave Egypt, but it takes 40 years for Egypt to leave them, <laughs> right? All the battles that we're going to go through for the next 40 years are apropos to what's necessary for them to grow and for those to die out so that Caleb and Joshua can move forward uh, with the children of Israel. So as we go forth um, into chapter 13, um, this is, you know, we'll see the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We'll see um, all of the things in this dramatic story of the crossing of the Red Street of Red Sea that are foundational. And here are the instructions, you know, that Yahuwah gives to Israel. You know, he gives the consecration of the firstborn. He gives the feast of unleavened bread. He gives the law concerning the firstborn, you know, and we follow it, you know, through the Israelites travel and even the unexpected direction that they go to. Why were they right there, right near where they needed to go. Why did it take them 40 years to get a short st stretch, right? All of this is necessary for them. And we'll find out why as we read through. Um, so <clears throat> chapter 13 has uh, 22 verses. Let's... Um, Let's do the first 10 verses and then we'll discuss uh, who would like to read the first 10 verses of chapter 13. And for all those that are new, um, okay, Mecca, but all those, for all those that are new, the way we do it is um, the person who reads gets to have first crack of what they believe they see. And then we discuss it and everyone adds in and kind of chimes in before we read the next chunk. So we, we go through verse by verse, so just to let you guys know. Take it away, Brother Michael. All right. All right. And Yahuwah spoke unto oh. Moshe, saying, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn. Whosoever opens the womb among the children of Yasharal, both of man and of beast, it is mine. And Moshe said unto the people, Remember this day in which you came out from Mitzrayim and out of the house of bondage. For by, strength, for by strength of hand, Yahuwah brought you out from this place. There shall no chemet be eaten, or no uh, leaven be eaten. This day came you out in the month of Eid. And it shall be when Yahuwah shall bring you into the land of the Canaanim, and the Chitim, and the Emorim, and the Chibim, and the Yebusim, which he swore unto your fathers to give you a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall keep this service in the month. Seven days you shall eat matzah, and in the seventh day shall be a feast to Yahuwah. Matzah shall be eaten seven days, and there shall no chemet be seen with you, neither shall there be leaven seen with you in all your quarters. And you shall show your son in that day, saying, This is done because of that which Yahuwah did unto me when I came forth out of Mitzrayim. And it shall be for a sign unto you upon your hand and for a memorial between your eyes that Yahuwah's Torah may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand has Yahuwah brought you out of Mitzrayim. You shall therefore guard this ordinance in his appointed time from year to year. 
Good job. Good job. What do we see there? Um, well, one thing I, I, I really uh, like about this section is that it, it shows you in, um, in, verse, in verse 9, it says, and it shall be a sign unto you upon your hand and for a memorial between your eyes, and you who was tore it may be in your mouth, for with a strong hand has you who have brought you out of Mitzrayim. So he's talking about this ordinance, this keeping of um, this day, you know, because uh, the feast of, of Pesach, um, that it's a sign for us upon our hand and for a memorial between our eyes. And we know, we also know that in Revelation, it talks about the mark of the beast being you know upon your hand and, be, and on your forehead and so you know this kind of shows you the the mark of yahuwah you know uh how how his feasts are you know a mark or a sign for us you know upon our hands and between our eyes that we should be keeping these things and so uh you know that was just something i, I really love about this this section um because it's you know as we as we know about revelation and the mark of the beast it kind of lets us know how to how we are separate you know um, and, and marked by yahuwah yeah i mean it's interesting um that particular verse you pull out is very uh it, it becomes prophetic and it becomes something carried out throughout um torah um and we know that <clears throat> you know um that the Hebrews in, 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 in the culture, um, historically, I think it's, I think it's recorded in Josephus. Um, they would <clears throat> fasten a small box, um, that contained passages of scripture. They would hold it in their hand and they would put it on their forehead during prayer. And it would serve as a memorial, um, as a physical sign of what was being internally done and them obeying God's instructions. And of course we have in Deuteronomy chapter six, right? This should all be familiar to all of you. Starting verse four, it says, Hear, O Israel, Yahuwah our Elohim is one. You shall love Yahuwah your Elohim with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gate. So we see that in this passage here in Exodus 13, this is a pre-mention of speaking of all of Torah, not just the feast, but all of Torah is, is to be set up as a memorial, as a sign of those who trust and believe in him. So um, great, great, uh, great verse to uh, start with there. Um, JP. Uh, verse two, you know, it says, sanctify unto me all the firstborn. And, and that word itself, it means um, kadash, right? Kadash. And it, and it can also, you know, a lot of times they use it for different words in the English, of course. So, but it says in the Strong's definitions, according to the Strong's definition, to be clean. And it's like, wow, like, I've been to places where they say, oh, you know, we don't baptize our children, but we dedicate them, you know, and, and that's kind of interesting because I didn't, I, I said, wow, that's, and here you kind of see that, that they're, they're doing like a, like Yahuwah is commanding them, sanctify unto me all the firstborn. And so, you know, I thought that was interesting um, that he used that word right there to show, it says, it is mine. And so. But it speaks only about the firstborn, as in, I wonder if that's like the marker of your family, you know, your lineage that's going to be after you, you know, 
And um, not saying that you can't dedicate the rest of your children, but that one first child is because he was the one to get all, you know, he was the, your firstborn is like, it's so, super important, you know, for our family lineage. So I just want to bring that out. Yeah, no, uh, good verse. Um, consecrate, uh, make holy, to make holy, right? Um, we look at it and it's uh, in some passage, in some uh, translations, it says, whatever opens the matrix, you know, whatever opens the womb. So they're calling the womb a matrix, you know, whatever opens the womb. So it wasn't just the firstborn of uh, men, it was the firstborn of beasts also. So we're going to see this further explained in, you know, in the next portion of our reading. Um, they expound on uh, what the law of the firstborn actually is. Um, so, good, good point, brother. Um, to make holy, you know, and you know, I think it was Brother Will that spoke. He was speaking, you know, pertaining to what um, Rick's message was talking about, but he brought out Romans twelve. And we are to consecrate ourselves in that same way. You know, we are to give our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, meaning that there is a cleansing that takes place in order to be used by him. He can't use us dirty. That's why in early in Romans, it says, reckon the old man dead. You know, this, this life, this old man is not to be reanimated. We're not to breathe new life back in it. We consecrate it, cleanse ourselves of that old man, bury him with Yahushua Messiah, rise up, right? That's a picture of the baptism, going down the old man, coming up, the new creature. We are consecrated, not only internally, but it's a visual representation of what we've done. And then we go on to live that way, you know, never to, to, to breathe new life back into that old man again. So. Um, Something interesting happens later, um, and, and we can look at it when it comes to the explanation of the law of the firstborn. So we'll look at that in, in full detail. Um, what else we see there? Well, I think that uh, what, what Brother uh, JP was just referring to is that firstborn that he's talking about there. You think about that, that's like a first fruit offering. That's your, that's your, your first unto Yahuwah giving this unto him. And, and he's talking about Yasharal here, you know. He's just not talking about anybody. He's talking specifically to them and, and their possessions. So that first fruit of your your loins, whether it's a, a, a human or a, an animal that's connected there, that you're, you're committing that unto him. So that's that lineage that you're passing on, you know, to the next generation. So it continues to... Uh, uh, the, uh, that word I'm trying to lose here. It can, it can continue on, anyways. But yeah, I was looking at that. I wanted to speak about that too. And and but again, the placement of these Aleph Tavs in this is is pretty amazing. As we see them in uh, starting in in the third verse here, where he says to Moshe, "Say unto the people, remember Aleph Tav this day." So this is a covenant day that that we're to remember. And that's what we're starting to see as we go through this and we remember and we're starting to relive this, the effects that it's having on us and how as we continue to do this, as we're going to see as we read on, the reason that we do this is to remember, you know, this is a covenant day that Yahuwah has brought us, you and I, out of our bondage, out of our Mitzrayim, by the strength of his hand. So he, he's doing the same thing to you and I in this, in this matter, if we see this. And, and even where he's talking about it, 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 this day, the month of Babib, you know, that's that, 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 the sprouting of life, you know, where the green comes forth. So we're coming out, of, he's bringing us out of this, and we're starting to spring forth and, and produce a fruit, you know, and that's that what we're bringing into. And then as we go into uh, the fifth one here, it comes in and he says, and you shall keep a left out of this service in this month. So he, he's even showing us even more of the covenant uh, symbolism within this that he's making because he's delivering them into this land of this, that he's promised them, their, their forefathers. This is a fulfillment of the covenant 
these signs that we see here are a fulfillment of that, that he's bringing them into this land that's flowing with milk and honey, you know. Uh, and then we see where he tells us for seven days that we're not to have sin in our lives, that unleavened bread. And in the seventh day, you shall have a feast unto Yahuwah, you know. You're going to be clean. You're going to be in a in a place that you're going to give honor to Him of that of all of your first fruits is what you're doing when you're coming through this. And then the matzah shall be eaten a left hav on the seventh day. So He He's He's continues to establish this seventh day the, uh, in the, in this feast and being without sin for those seven days as this example that we're not to to have any shemets or any leaven or any sin with you or neither even seen in all your quarters so there's a purification process that we recognize it takes place during this because it's the, he's establishing this covenant with us as yasharel you know his people and then we see it again the final one that we see here is that you shall in the 10th uh, verse you shall guard a left hob, this ordinance in this appointed time from year to year. So there he's established that covenant that we're going to continue to do this, to remember this and to honor what you, is doing done for us, how he set us free from our bondages, you know, our Mitzrayim. And he's put us on this path of being free from sin and bondage, you know? So now we it goes back to being able to set us free to be able to hear him, to follow him on this journey that we're about to go on, you know, with the with the Israelites or Yisrael, you know. So that's what I see there. I think that's pretty cool how all of those things line up once again. Ah, uh, brother, great breakdown. You know, as we look at the the verses that you expounded on, specifically um, verses three and four. Remember this day, we see him break down what he was explaining in in chapter 12 verses 41 42 he says and it came to pass at the end of the four excuse me 430 years on the very same day it came to pass that all the armies of yahuwah went out from the land of egypt it is a night of solemn observance to yahuwah for bringing them out of the land of egypt this is the night of Yahuwah, a solemn observance for all the children of Israel throughout their generations. And in verse 51, he says, and it came to pass on the very same day that Yahuwah brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, according to the army. So that is what it's referring to when it says, remember this day. And then you went on to speak about it saying the month of Abib, explaining again back in chapter 12, verse two, where he says, this month shall be the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you, Abib. So we see scripture commentating scripture. You know what I mean? It's almost like, well, where do we get these ideas from? You know, where do you see that at? Look, it's in scripture, you know, and for, for years and years, just overreading it and not understanding it. And here we have the full explanation, um, you know, uh, premised by you know, Olive Tavs, you mentioned, and just by explaining what was read to us before in chapter 12. So it's it's great to see these things have life. You know, these promises stay true. So praise Yah. Um, Omeka was next. Um, Sister Poppy had her hand up after that, and then JP. Yeah, I just wanted to touch on uh, verse 2 that JP was bringing up because you know, it's <clears throat> that firstborn, you know, uh, you know, for instance, you know, if I had an older brother, you know, who was firstborn or whatnot, you know, I would be looking up to him, you know, that would be, you know, the, usually the firstborn or the oldest is, is usually a role model for the rest of the siblings as well, you know, and not, you know, as well as a, a carrier to the inheritance, you know, or the, um, you know, uh, risk in honor of the family and so you know it says in um uh first peter chapter two uh just starting at uh let me see starting at 
verse 19, it says, uh, for this is thankworthy. If a man for conscious towards Yahuwah endure grief, suffering wrongfully, for what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with Yah. For even hereunto were you called, because Hamashiach also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously, who his own self bore our sins in his, in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And so I just, I really appreciate this verse because it just shows us like, you know, that Hamashiach is our example. It's, it's him. He's the, he's the first fruits as, as uh, Rick pulled out, you know, he's the first fruits and we should be walking in his likeness. Um, and then I just want to read uh, verse one of chapter four, because I think it just concludes it nicely. It says, for as much then as Hamashiach has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Uh, and then verse two, it says that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of Yahuwah. And so I just, you know, just, you know, touching on that, you know, him being the firstborn, the example, the, the lead, you know, carrying the honor, you know, um, that's exactly what the firstborn should be doing. You know, the firstborn should be that example. Um, for the family to to keep the honor. Yeah, that, I mean I, that's 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 a good connection. I, I found I, I don't want to call it a better connection, but here's another connection um, uh, because that what you just brought out was good. So this is not necessarily better, <laughs> but I think it ties in directly with the, verse two of chapter thirteen. Amy's laughing. I'm not I'm not dissing my brother. I'm accompanying what he brought out. I'm accompanying that with another add scripture. To, add All to right? it. So, right, absolutely. So Luke chapter 2, um, verse 21, and this is the circumcision of our Messiah. It says, well, let's start in verse 21. It says, and when eight days were completed, speaking of Yahushua, Yahushua for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Yahushua the given name by the angels before he was conceived in the womb. Verse 22, now when the days of, of the, her purification, according to the law of Moshe, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him <clears throat> to Yahuwah. As it is written in the law of Yahuwah, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy, consecrated, right, before Yahuwah and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of Yahuwah, a pair of turtle doves or a young dove or young pigeons. So here we see the culmination of what it's talking about in the law of Moshe here in consecrating the firstborn child, the one who opens the matrix, the one who opens the womb. But we do know that there are occasions throughout scripture and even now in our lives now, we see sometimes that not that firstborn isn't necessarily the one to look up to. You know, sometimes it's that second or third son that the older one looks up to, you know. And uh, it's interesting, you know, as we see that also in scripture, right? Uh, but yeah, good passages, brother. Um, that accompanied with that passage creates a beautiful symphony. Praise God. Sounded to me like you guys were saying the same thing. Yeah, yeah, well, I, I just wanted yeah, to speak to because it was Yahusha as the baby as the, as the firstborn example. Right. Yeah. No. No. That's why I said it accompanies it. Yeah. Yeah. Perfectly accompanying it. Right. Right. Well, um, it. Not better. Didn't I say that? Didn't I say that's it's not better? Exactly what you said that's exactly <laughs> right, right. what. You said. Yes, you did, honey. <laughs> Thank you, babe. Um, <laughs> JP, baby, confirmation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just 
I just want to mention, you know, how, how beautiful it is that Yahuwah has uh, revealed and brought us back to his, his instructions and his correct, you know, walk. Um, how it says in verse 13, I mean, uh, verse 3, you know, what has been mentioned already, but remember this day. And then, he, and then you add that with verse 10. He says, thou shalt therefore keep this ordinance in his season from year to year. And so, you know, there was a time when I never even see, I never even would have seen that or understood that, you know, but, you know, he really did show and in his scriptures, in his scriptures, in his word, exactly what we're, what we're doing now in our lives, you know, so I just want to mention that. Yeah, but, yeah no, and, and, and so the interesting thing about that, it says year to year, but in the ordinance itself means that every time a firstborn is is comes to comes to be. So it's more than year to year. It's it's even in between. Because all year long, there's a firstborn of your cattle, there's a firstborn of your livestock, there's a firstborn, you know, of uh husband and wife. So um we see that this uh remains true throughout scripture. Um it was an ordinance. Um, even in, as we read in the passage that Mecca uh, read out of um, the brick and uh, the passage that I brought forward as well. So, praise God. We see a lot going on here. What else do we see? Um... So we see um um in verse 1 it says, Yahuwah spoke to Moshe. Um, and we see, you know, there was a special relationship here. You know, one of the things that I, that I remember from Rick's message this morning was, if you don't have a relationship with someone, you don't know how they respond. Like, you know, my wife can, not always, but almost, you know, if if I'm not there, she can answer for me, you know, in most cases, or at least close to how we respond and, and vice versa. And knowing Yah, spending time with Yah, having a relationship with Yah means that you hear from him. You know, um, if we look in um, Exodus chapter 33. Um, verse, verse 11, so Yahuwah spoke to Moshe face to face as a man speaks to his friend and he would return to the camp, but his servants, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man did not depart from the tabernacle. So we see that there was a special relationship and we spoke of you know, if he was face to face, it would have had to, you know, have been, you know, a miracle, you know, in a sense, it would have had to have been um, something specific, something special that we have to look into further. But I think it speaks of the powerful relationship that he had, that he could hear from Yah in the way in which he did. And it goes back to us hearing from Yah you know, the relationship that we have to have with him. I thought that was an interesting verse that we should look at. Um, it is mine, you know, consecrating, making holy. It is mine. It is Yahuwah's, you know, I think JP brought that out. It is mine. <clears throat> you know, all of these things are to show 
that we remember what Yahuwah did for us in bringing us out of Egypt. So what else do we see there, uh, Brother Mecca? Um, I thought something was very interesting just looking at uh, just putting together. So, you know, there's that verse that talks about, um, you know, you know, don't be don't think that it's because of your righteousness. I don't know where it's at. If anybody has it, um, please let me know um, or bring it out. Uh, it's It talks about where, you know, don't think that because of your righteousness that you who, you know, has done these things. Um, but, it, you know, it speaks about pretty much, you know, the righteousness of our fathers and, and, and his covenant that he has made with Abraham, you know, uh, Esau and Yaakov, that, you know, he has um, delivered us from our enemies. Um, and I just think it's very interesting how, you know, that's something, you know, of course, you, you know, if, if you come out of a place and you see these great, um, these great wonders that you has done, you know, to deliver you, you know, immediately anybody would be, you know, puffed up with pride and yeah, you know, you, yeah, you be, like, you better let us go. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I could see people walking off like, yeah, you, you better let us go, you know, before something else happens to you or, you know, people getting puffed up. But, you know, I think it's very interesting that the first thing Yahuwah does is he's like, yeah, now eat unleavened bread with no leaven in it so that you stay humble. You know what I mean? That, that, that leaven kind of representing or the unleavened bread representing, you know, the, the, um, sin, you know, getting rid of sin and also that pride that, that, that puffs us up, you know, thinking that, okay, yeah, now, now we're just delivered and, and, and we're good. And, you know, you know, like, you know, just, just the pride that people can get filled up with from seeing that. And so I think like the symbolism of, of Yahuwah making them eat unleavened bread you know, after this deliverance, you know, is, is, you know, and to symbolize it and keep it for memorial after this deliverance, like, you know, it's, it's really because of the promises that he's made to our ancestors is the reason why you're being delivered, but not because of your righteousness. So don't, don't get, you know, don't get it twisted and don't get puffed up, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's a good example. I mean, you know, <clears throat> it made me think about, you know, you mentioned earlier about having a big brother, you know, someone to look up to, you know, um, I'm a big brother, but I also have a big brother too, but I know, you know, I'm, I'm closer in age to my younger brother. My oldest, my older brother is six years older than me. So there was a big difference and we didn't really grow up together. Um, and when we were together, you know, you know, it was for a brief period of time, but with my younger brother, we're only two years apart. So there were many times where he would do things knowing that I was around, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it was, it was normally, you know, that source of protection, you know, he could say something extra or do something a little extra, puff his chest out a little bit more because I was there, you know, um, and, the, the, but the mature person says, I'm not going to put myself or my brothers in danger by doing something that I wouldn't normally do if he wasn't around. You know what I mean? So like, like in like manner, <clears throat> we are to recognize the memorial set before us, you know, to know that it was the faith of Moshe, you know, um, and, and being the leader of, of the firstborn, Yah's people, that he made his covenants with. It was the faith of um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who, who he made his covenant with. And, and, you know, we have that through the blood of Yahushua. We now can be called sons, right? So... Um, very good point to point out that we don't get puffed up because of, you know, the righteousness that it was bestowed upon us that we have to continually live in. <clears throat> but we are humbled by it and we memorialize those times, those days, and we keep them forever. <clears throat> They're not done away with. Praise God. Um, good point, brother. Uh, Sister Amy. <clears throat> yeah, 
It was interesting. I, I was actually wanting to mention about the milk and honey, but it, it kind of ties in with the Mecca, what he was saying as well about, you know, the it's about addressing. Um, in verse 3, it says, and Moses said unto the people, remember this day. Um, that word is a recent word I was studying called zakah, you know, remember, like remember the Sabbath. Uh, remember this day, it speaks. And then he, he gives us a memory of obviously come, of us remembering to come out of um, Mitzrayim, the house of bondage. Um, and then tells us to eat no leavened bread, which I see the same as a Mecca as being like a form of um, spiritually as pride. And then it's interesting in verse five, it, what's standing out to me is the land of milk and honey again is mentioned. Um, I was just doing some reading online about it to kind of get some insight on it. And milk and honey in Hebrew can be as well expressed as a place of abundance and consistently overflowing and flourishing with nourishing pro provides from the father. But it's interesting that he gives them he gives them a, 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 an order. He tells them to remember it. Then he says, if, if you do it, when I bring you into all your enemies' land, Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Hivites, and Jebusites, which are actually five of the enemies mentioned, there's seven, I think, in scripture of these like clans or groups of people. And then he says, um, if you do it, when I bring you into these places of the enemy, which I swore to you in verse five, I swore to unto thy fathers to give thee a land flowing with milk and honey. That's interesting to me because it's saying, once you do this, then I'll give you this. And going back to what Emeka said, then it speaks about the unleavened bread straight after it. It says, don't find it in your house. Like find no pride in your house because as soon as pride comes, I'm taking that milk and honey away. Well, yeah, I like I definitely like um your your first analogy um you know on verse five where it says and it shall be when Yahuwah brings you into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Hivites and the Jebusites which he swore to your fathers to give you the land flowing with milk and honey um, <clears throat> and we see we see that you know spoke of spoke of earlier in chapter in chapter 12 right um <clears throat> if you look at verse we talked about it last week right or two weeks ago yeah we did i think i don't know where though yeah <laughs> in the in the previous chapter yeah, but but also too, it it when he says he speaks, you know, from your fathers. Um, in Genesis seventeen eight, it says, "Also I give you, and your descendants after you, the land in which you are a stranger, all land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their Elohim." You know, so. In verse nine, he goes on to, to to say, you know, this is a covenant. So this is a promise that is continually brought up, you know, that is continually shown. This is the promise I made and I'm going to keep it. This is my covenant to you. So milk and honey encompasses that also, which you say. But I think in the grand scheme, it speaks of the richness of the land the wealth of the land in general, that there will be no need that they would desire because it will be all there for them. So, praise God. <clears throat> what else we see there? Are we ready to move on to the next several verses? We can read, oh, go ahead, Michael. Oh, yeah, I just touching on the milk and honey. Uh, I just wanted to, you know, because we know that, you know, there's the sincere milk of the word, you know, and then we also know, um, I think it's in it's in Isaiah chapter seven. 
um, when it talks about Yahusha and his birth, it says, uh, when it's prophesied, it says, therefore, Adonai himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bring forth an infant son whose name is called Emmanuel. Uh, this is Isaiah chapter 7, verse um, 14 through 16. And it says, butter and honey shall he eat that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the, the land that you abhor shall be forsaken for both her kings. And so um, just, I guess, 14 and 15, you know, butter and honey shall he eat that he may know to refuse the good, you know, and there's kind of like the symbolism of, you know, Yahuwah's word, um, um, Yahuwah's word, his, his instructions. Um, I think in, in revelations, John talks about, uh, Yahuwah, the, the angel gave him a scroll to eat and it was sweet as honey uh, on his tongue and, and bitter, you know, in his belly. And so like Yahuwah's, uh, Torah, his word, you know, his scroll is also, like honey you know and when you get into that land you know of course we know the israelites were you get into the land don't don't partake in their sins you know of the enemy do not go after their ways because the moment you begin to go after their ways and partake in their sins then what that land uh is taken from you it's stripped and so staying in the word you know eating eating take having a sincere milk of the word you know, digesting that, um, consuming that and uh, keeping his Torah, you know, walking his ways, refusing the evil. You know, it, it's hand, it goes hand in hand with being able to partake in the milk of hun and honey of the land, the abundance of the land. You know, you have, if you, once you disconnect from the milk and honey, you, who was word, his instructions, refusing to do uh, evil then it's like boom the land is now now the land is stripped from you the milk and honey is stripped from you you know spiritually and physically well i mean you <clears throat> yes i mean i think you can um you know from from the passage that we are currently in in exodus when when you were to veer off and you were to be in sin you would be cut off and so you would be unable to partake. So I think ultimately um, the, the, the larger picture is, you know, complete with your explanation of what the word is, um, the removal of sin, not partaking in <clears throat> the sins of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Jebusites, so on and so forth but that this land that i'm giving you i'm taking away from them and giving it to you it's your gift for my first one um and those of you that are in me reside there you're you're only going to be in the camp if you law obey my laws statutes and commandments so um i i definitely think that's a greater picture of of, of what it's saying here um but ultimately it's it's I'm taking this land from them right now, this physical land, and it is a land that is going to be of abundance for you and your generations. Um, what we see in, in, in symbolism as the word, you know, comes as a greater picture for what we see going forward. But yes, I agree. Um, good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, We stopped in verse 10. If nothing else is there, we can uh, move on to the next several verses. Let's go from verse 11 and, and read through 16. Stop at verse 17. Who wants to take that? JP? Yes, sir. You said... Uh 11 to 16 right read yes 11 to 16 okay it says and it shall be when yahuwah shall bring thee into the land of the canaanites as he swear unto thee and to thy fathers and shall give it to thee or give it thee that thou shalt set apart unto yahuwah all that openeth the matrix and every firstling that cometh of a beast which thou hast the male shall be yahuwah's 
And every firstling of a donkey thou shalt redeem with a lamb. And if thou wilt not redeem it, then thou shalt break his neck. And all the firstborn of man among thy children shalt thou redeem. And it shall be when thy son ask, asketh thee in time to come, saying, What is this? That thou shalt say unto him, By strength of hand of Yahuwah, or strength of hand, Yahuwah brought us out from Egypt from the house of bondage. And it came to pass when Pharaoh would hardly let us go that Yahuwah slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrifice to Yahuwah all that opened at the matrix, being males. But all the firstborn of my children I redeem, and it shall be for a token upon thine hand and for frontlets between thine eyes. For by strength of hand, Yahuwah brought us forth out of Egypt. Uh, the word just kept jumping out at me, redeem, redeem, you know, and that was, that was pretty, you know, I, I know, I, I feel like it somehow connects to Messiah, <laughs> you know, him redeeming us. And, and it said in verse 13, I'll just speak on that one. It says, and every first thing of a donkey thou shalt redeem with the lamb. And so to redeem uh, the donkey was with the lamb. And then it also said, um, and all the firstborn of man among thy children shalt thou redeem. So that was kind of interesting that it was going to be redeemed with a lamb to, re you know, so I know I'm, that's all I got. I mean, I'm just like in this, it's just something there. I know something's there. I just ain't, you know, can't put my words around it. So, so, so how were, so, so that's a great place to start. I mean, cause this, cause there's a lot of stuff in here that's just like, what, you know what I mean? Like, huh? You know what I mean? It, 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 you know, but you know, we don't stop there. That that just makes us look further. So, what does what did did you when you redeem something? You had to what? Sacrifice. So a donkey was not con considered an animal that you could sacrifice. So you had to sacrifice a lamb to redeem that firstborn donkey to consecrate so that's what that's speaking of there um firstborn male donkey was redeemed with the lamb um and similarly the israelites were redeemed with the firstborn sons of the of of the egyptians right through their death causing pharaoh's mind to change and say let them go you know right it, it 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 there was a cost to pay that they, they had to be redeemed in blood like that's never looked at you know we don't look at that and say that they redeemed but that this was you've done this to my firstborn this is what i'm doing to your firstborn as to set my firstborn free right so the redeeming was through the blood of the egyptians the blood of the lamb redeemed all of those that would follow him right so all of these things you know we have to look at when we look at the law of the firstborn um and we can look into it deeper what else who else wants to speak on these things it's a lot in this it's a lot in this portion of, of, of uh, scripture <clears throat> Right. So, I mean, because we one of the things we have to do, um, look at and I got you, JP. Um, was that. Uh, so they weren't. All right. I, I, I made them They weren't redeemed by <laughs> the Egyptians. They were redeemed by the blood of the lamb. The cost that was paid for them, though, was that they lost their firstborn sons. So there is a difference between being redeemed by the Egyptians and redeemed by the blood of the lamb. It was where on the doorpost that caused them to pass over so that their firstborn sons wouldn't be taken. But the cost of it was that they lost their firstborn sons in the process. So go ahead, brother. And just to speak on verse 16, um, 
all of this that we just read, you know, it, it ends and concludes like in a way of saying in verse 16, and it shall be for a token upon thine hand and for frontlands between thine eyes. For by strength of hand, Yahuwah brought us out, brought us forth out of Egypt. And that's the same thing with that mark that we were speaking about because that's the same thing with the mark. It's, it's the mark that the same phrase is used in Revelation, you know, uh, speaking about the mark of the beast. And then there's a, a, a also like a mark or a sign of the covenant upon you. So it's, it's pretty interesting the way I've always like noticed how, how there's like this night and day kind of or black and white. I don't know. It's like a contrast between the way Yahuwah does things and the way he puts it down and, and on, on the words and, and then now Hasatan will come and try to um, mimic what he does and, and do the same to kind of like, so I can see where people can be deceived in that way of, of like, oh, well, this looks like him. When, when Messiah says, when, when uh, he says that they come in Matthew 24, when you see this anti-Messiah or antichrist, you're going to, don't go, you know, because it's going to portray the same. So just, I mean, kind of going back to Exodus, though, you know, we're seeing this. It's interesting. So I, I just wanted to ask the question, like, what is being spoken of in verse 16 that what shall be for a token upon thine hand? And for frontless between thine eyes um, from your understanding. Like, what does that mean? Like what, what shall be, you know what I'm saying? Like, what's that, you know? So is there something you got to say on that? So, so I, and to my understanding, it's all inclusive because it goes back to what we talked about in verse nine. It says, it shall be for a sign. It's all inclusive. So they're speaking about the consecration. They're speaking about the memorial of the day that they came out of Egypt. It's all inclusive, meaning this is the covenant. What we see in Deuteronomy 6, chapter 4 through chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, is this. All of this, all of Torah, all of scripture is a sign of those, you know, by us carrying out these things, by people seeing us every year gather and go to Sukkot together and go to Pesach together, you know by us keeping the commandments, by us keeping the Sabbath day, you know, by us people knowing us by our love. All of these things are a sign for those that are his, you know. So when, when because if you notice, it speaks of each ordinance individually and says a sign afterwards. But in Deuteronomy, we see that it's speaking of all of it. It's it's speaking of that's why I read the passages in Deuteronomy because it includes everything. It includes all of the feasts, it includes all includes all of the law, it includes all of the precepts and, and, and commandments. It's all for a sign. So so to me, that's what it's speaking of um, when it talks about this, these things, the day, the time, girding your clothes, eating in hate haste, you know, no leaven in the bread, removal of sin, freedom in Egypt, the trip through the wilderness, the feeding, <laughs> the golden calf, all of it, all of it is to be remembered and we keep it as a sign. So, praise Yah. Um, is that, does that answer or come as close to answering your question? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. definitely. I. I... I think some my thoughts were in the same place of the whole, you know, all is in just everything, the instructions, like you're saying, everything in one. How will people know, you know, going back to 16, yeah. I've always understood it by saying, how will they know? Uh, it says, and shall be a token upon thine hand. And I've always looked at the hand as a work where, where my hand moves and how it works. And then, that be frontless between the eyes, you know, the brain, the mind, the understanding, the heart, or you know, you know. So definitely, I, I see exactly what you're saying. I, I you know, and it's it. it's funny because you 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 said hand, you know, and it, you know, it it speaks of whatever the hand does, right? 
that's how you know. But it also speaks of whatever the hand doesn't do, because you lay your hand to the plow, right? Do you not lay your hand to the plow on the Sabbath day? You know what I mean? So so it all means the same thing. You know what I mean? So we got to look at all those things. It's a beautiful scripture is so poetic like when you look at it and there there are areas where it's so abstracted it leaves you just like man let me look at this a little bit more let me find some passages to help explain this um and at the very least ask the question because sometimes the questions are what causes us right here and now to find it real time you know and i i praise y'all for the way that we study so that we can do that um but yeah man that's what I see. Brother Mecca, then Amy, then Linda, and then Poppy. Yeah, I was just looking at um, verse um, 13 uh, when it talks about every first thing of an ass you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem it, then you shall break his neck, and all the firstborn of man among your children shall shall uh you redeem so i was kind of seeing you know i was i was looking and trying to see if there was a, any connection between yahusha um you know redeeming you know because we know yashara was his, is his firstborn so yahusha being that lamb to redeem yashara um you know and then um it also it also mentions that uh it says if you will and then it says um uh, in verse 13 it says and if you will not redeem redeem it i i guess speaking of the ass it says you shall break his neck and all the firstborn of man among your children shall you redeem and so um i was wondering if there was a connection you know just just hit my mind like maybe you know or just 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 speculatively if there was a connection between Yehuda, uh, Yehuda Iscariot, um, hmm. you know, breaking his neck or or or, or being hung, you know, and, and killing himself, you know, by um, hanging himself, um, and the redeeming of Yashara as well, um, you know, just between Yahusha being the lamb and, and Judas possibly being the ass whose neck was broke. So, just a couple things that just hit my mind. I don't know if anybody. Yeah, that's that's a that's a good question. Um, and I'm gonna be honest with you guys. I, you know that that whole part about breaking the neck, you know, escapes my mind. Like I don't know what that means. Um, I I'm trying to find this passage I was looking at. It might speak on it, but I'm not sure. Um. I know when the Levites the Levites get dedicated instead of the firstborn in Numbers chapter three, but I don't know that it says anything about breaking of the neck. Um, something that I have to look into. That passage is definitely speaking about the firstborn and the Levites uh, being dedicated um for service so uh something i'm gonna have to look into to to myself if anybody has an answer to that let's let's find out um while we go along um sister amy and sister linda sister poppy keeps putting her hand down is this sister poppy to go first no you're first okay something very interesting brother rod that i have to speak to you about right now. Okay. <laughs> in in verse nine, I've just found some bit of treasure. Okay. The word that we're talking about for a sign. Guess what word it is in the Hebrew? Odiot. It's the word odiot. It's the word out what we were talking about the other week because it's the reason why i know and it jumped in my mind before because brother mecca mentioned this sign and then jp and i thought hold on a minute a sign i said it and i thought this is what the word odio means 
you know, the 22 pictograph, the pictures, they are called the letters of oath. They are called odiote. And that's the word, they shall be for an odiote unto thee and upon thine hand. Um, very interesting because obviously I've been, as I study the, the odiote and I only recently um, fully delved into the meaning of this sign in our heads. Now, when I study the odiote, what I find is my mind is... All right, so... So, so tell me what the audio is, because I don't know what you're talking about. What is the oh, audio? okay, sorry. It's basically the sorry. Forgive me, brother. I thought you know. It's the basically the twenty-two pictograph letters. Okay. The word, the word we know as the aleph tav is called the at, which is the aleph and the tav. But if you put a an u, a vav, a nail in the middle of them, which is the, it makes the word oath or out. Um, which is the word odiote, which is the word that's used here right now in this. It's the word lamed, aleph, vav, tav. But the lamed is just basically a, an expressive of like the word hey is for the word the. Lamed is similar. And then the actual word for oath that's being used for a sign is the word aleph, uau, tau, which is Odiote, that is how you write odiote in Hebrew. Because I've just been recently studying this word because it says the 22 letters are for a sign to his people. And they are, they are actually called letters of oath from him to us. And I just blew off my chair then when I was sitting here, when I see and I thought, what is the word being used here? And it's the word odiote, the 22 pictures. It's very interesting when you see this, because when I've seen this, because it's like, as JP said, in our actions and in our thoughts, you know, is, is the sign on our hand and our forehead, you know, do we physically put a sign on our hands and head? I don't believe we do, no. Well, I mean, it's in, in this case, though, um, one of the things we have to keep in mind is context with the way it's used, specifically here, and then what we read later in Deuteronomy, it's more of a pledge. This pledge I have, I'm showing my pledge, showing that I belong to Yahweh. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, what okay. In, in, in verse nine, it says, and it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hand. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say hands, which is interesting because we know hand and right hand in the revelation of the sign of the beast, et cetera. And, and it, it's very interesting because to me, do you do no actions with your left hand? We know Messiah said, let not your right see what the left is, etc. You know, he says that saying about don't let your left hand see what your right hand is doing. I find it very interesting that they're actually using the word odio here. That's just a real amazing revelation for me. Um, because it then says, and for a memorial, which is again, the same word is for the word remember, a remembrance. No. Now, where are you seeing odio? I see, I see oath. Yes. O so, o -T -H, so, I see mm -hmm. so from the original. In verse nine, from in original, verse nine, the word for a sign, the word for a sign in Hebrew, in verse nine, is the word, is the, the word la out. La at or la out is, 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 um, lamed aleph. Wow, tau in verse nine. That's the word, the odiote, the sign for a so sign the is la out, which is the name of the 22 pictures as a whole, all together, which I find profound because Messiah said he was the at, but then the out, the sign means the aleph joined to the tab. That's basically what it is a picture of. It's the Aleph joined to the tab. Very, very interesting that that's what's put in there for me anyway, um, because we know we're meant to think upon him and act according. So I, I'm just laying it out there. I could be wrong, but when I see that, it makes me excited because obviously I, I've been getting ministered by the Father with the, with the 22 letters, pictures. So okay. I'm... 
that because they're pictures and we see them and we remember them as well so i'm seeing the action and then i'm seeing and seeing the memorial between my eyes is i'm persistently thinking upon these images that he's given me not worldly images but images of that the father's expressing to me that are of himself and his oath to me i'm sorry i hope i haven't gone off track no no i mean i think um i think i understand what you're saying um you know, the, I, I I never heard that odiot, <laughs> but I you know, and 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 thanks for educating me. But I think, you know, when I look at this and then I look at the words used and the Hebrew um, translations, pledge, signs, standards, witness, wonders. You know, these things are always um, spoken of in connection with how you're able to tell not only who he is, but how you're able, how he's able to tell who his people are. You know, so it's definitely an ordinance that sticks. These signs you keep, they show you my covenant continually. So we always got to keep that in mind. So the, the audio is, is something new for me, um, but no, I appreciate that, that understanding uh, that, we, that you just shared. Um, Sister Linda, Uh, yes, uh, as far as what Amy is talking about, with uh, the law in front of the oath, the reason why the law is, is the law is before the oath is just a, a prefix meaning for. So that means uh, the uh, lamed, when you put a, a lamed at the beginning of a word, it means either two or four. And so in this particular case, it means for a sign. That's why the law is there, the lamed is there. And uh, but what I wanted to talk about was the second part of the of the scripture. Um, well, not in this particular one, but as far as the frontlets are between the eyes. Now, the frontlets, they were like two little leather uh, bags, right, that they wore on a binder on a ribbon. Well, one was placed there, literally placed on the forehead, and it contained a parchment of scripture there. So I suppose that's why that um, comparison is being made there to be for oh, uh, upon thine uh, hand and for frontlets of, 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 of between thine eyes. So that, that was a literal thing. They actually did wear, I don't know whether it was just the priest or if everyone, probably everyone, uh, they wore, they, they kept a, 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 part, a, a portion of scripture, like the Shema, uh, in that frontlet, right between their eyes, on, the, on their forehead there. I just wanted to make that a point. Yeah, no, I, I, I saw that in my, um, in my research as well. It was, um, uh, I, in my research, I, I didn't see a leather casing. What I saw, a small box. So I don't, I don't, I don't know how they hung that on their forehead, but um, it, it did say passage of scripture that they would put on their forehead. Yeah, uh, uh, could have been a, a pouch, some type of yeah, just pouch, some type right. of bag or whatever. Right, I'm sure everyone right. didn't. Have yeah, 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 yeah. I saw the same thing in my research as well. Yo, no, thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, we have we have scripture, um, and then some things that that aren't necessarily that we don't necessarily see. There there is tradition. Now we're not to replace scripture with tradition, but we can glean off tradition in reference to what scripture is saying because some of the some of the um, traditions emulated exactly what scripture was saying but we do know that tradition also created the talmud you know what i mean so we have to be clear on what we use um for our understanding but i, I think that that's a good example of what we're looking at here um, because we know that it's not necessarily something physical we have to put on our hand or something physical we have to put on our forehead but the the memorial it's supposed to be on our heart, written, stamped. 
so that our bodily actions, you know, whatever we put our hands to do, it <clears throat> is in his, <clears throat> excuse me, is in his name. Praise y'all. Um, good conversation. I'm enjoying this. <clears throat> and I'm learning some new things too. Thank you for all of you that are adding to the conversation. Um, I, I appreciate it. Um, Sister Poppy. Um, I, the whole frontlets was bothering me a little bit. Felt like I need to look into it some more while you guys are talking. And I do apologize for keep putting my hand down. The baby's a little cranky today <laughs> and get real loud. So I'll take it down if that happens. But um, I was looking up the Strong's and it referenced the theological workbook of the Old Testament or if anybody used this to study with. Is it okay if I read what's what in it? here? It's a theological workbook of the Old Testament. It addresses the frontlets. It pretty much every word in the Old Testament. Go ahead. It, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. Let's see, let's um, see what you got. It, Okay, it says in here that it's always plural and denotes a mark or sign placed on the forehead between the eyes of, as a memorial. It says the placing of frontlets upon the forehead is always associated with making signs upon your hand. A common means of identifying slaves in the ancient Near East was to mark their hands and or their foreheads. Perhaps these frontlets were markings, uh, were marking Israelites as Yahuwah's servants who were to be identified by allowing the law to permeate their thoughts and actions. The literal marking, whatever the form, in the primary sense, in the figurative equation with Yahuwah's commandments as the frontlets. Um, okay, it goes on to list different times that it is, but what it said is that later jewelry, the Jewish people, um, took these frontlets in a literal ostentatious way and were rebuked. Or they tied little boxes on their foreheads and wrists and placed scriptures verses in them as a reminder. One of these phylacteries was found in the caves of Qumran. And that's all it said. So I don't believe that kind of explains it to me a little bit better that it did happen around Yahusha's time when he was on earth that they were making the actual physical but it like building up those it always remind me of top hats on their foreheads for some reason little top hats <laughs> yeah but, no I mean that, that's that's very that's very reminiscent of what I said concerning the boxes yeah um that, that you know that I found in my research um I have a couple different books, Biblical World and Josephus Antip 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 um, Complete Works of jo Josephus. Um, but I think, you know, even in that, we have to see how sometimes tradition took away from what the Father was actually saying. You know what I mean? We're hanging trinkets from our head, you know, when he just wants the mind that is in his son to also be in us. You know, when he wants it to be planted on our hearts, you know, the the the, the Zizi reminding us not to sin. You know, all of these things are symbols for what is taking place in our hearts, Romans 12. You know what I mean? And just because you have it on, it means absolutely not, nothing. You know, you know, there were people walking around with seat seats that were in sin. You know, um, so the physical aspects are are good for our understanding when it comes to what it meant. You know, what the what the father's saying as we look at the words used in the scriptures that we have, and then a historical, you know. Um, expression of what we see. So we have the historical, you know, accounts of the boxes from the foreheads and the markings on the hands. 
but Yah is all, always meant for us to do it on our inward parts. So as long as we get that, <laughs> you know, we're we're good. But yeah, thank you for your um for what you shared with us. That's that helps our understanding because we're reading these words, you know, and we don't want to be like we were in the past, just read past them. Oh yeah, well, frontlets. All right, let's keep it moving. No. What is the frontlet, man? You know, what does it mean? You know, what do these things mean? Like we have to engage. We have to ask the question. We have to look to find out what these things are. So um, thank you for sharing that. Um, Sister Amy. Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, uh, it's me, I'm just thinking about this whole study thing of what Abba's trying to say, you know, what Abba's speaking to us and it's, you make me laugh so we can easily say, you know, you won't be turning up next week with a black box or whatever on your head. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I meaning no disrespect to those who do so, I mean, each to their own, but uh, um, I just wanted to say, when JP was speaking before about the, the mark, you know, we've got the sign mark here in, of Yetwa, and then we've got of the covenant, and then we've got of the, the sign mark of the beast. And uh, just my own studies and opinion, I guess. But for me, the understanding of that would be um, <clears throat> the mark of the, of the sign of the one of the beast would be the mark of the flesh to me. The mark of one who is consumed in their mind with self and the flesh for example i'm just given going back to when i was first redeemed or you know first called home my mind was warped i could not stand in a queue uh, waiting without cussing and cursing i i could you know i would think thoughts that i didn't even allow to you know didn't even know where they came from my mind was just persistently doing its own thing it was marked by the flesh. It was marked by persistent thoughts of the world and the flesh. And so were my actions. And that is what <clears throat> I'm seeing as a mark of the beast. For me, in, for me, the mark of the beast and the harlot is one who is subjected and hauled themselves out in the flesh to the idols of the flesh, to self first. And then obviously the thoughts that come with that would be the markings or the scars of that which you do in the flesh. So if we reverse it and go like, you know, how does that work with Abba? Well, I know for me, like I just said, the sign, the mark, I'll use the pictograph as an example. I see these pictures, but I see, for example, when I look at you as a brother, do you show signs, a sign to me that you are who he says you are or, or who you say you are? So I will look for that sign. And that sign to me is obviously we know from actions, mainly actions, but we don't know what goes on in the, I don't know what's going on in your head. You don't know what's going on in my head. We only know that lest the father mark us. But I know when I suffered with mental health, that which was in my head came out until he redeemed me and changed me and gave me self-control and gave me these things that I was able to actually contemplate and say, well, this is actually not acceptable in society. So he took me from being animalistic Amy, marked by the beast and whatever else, to the Amy redeemed or changing Amy to being marked by him, one he set aside special for him. So this is what I'm seeing in this, because I know I was walked. The, the example I had was King Nebuchadnezzar. I think we see a lot in his example. He, treat, he treated people like animals. He thought they were animals. He acted like they were animals and kept good for himself. What did Abba do? He threw him out in the field and turned him into an animal. He became his heart, a hairy monster with long nails in a field, literally. That's what he became. And that's what I'm seeing the beast and the harlot are, not America or Britain. Or <laughs> I'm looking at me, like, where's the beast in me, in Amy? Where's the harlot in Amy? Well, the harlot in Amy is when she subjects to the thoughts that are not of her father. 
I am holding myself out to another father who doesn't even know me. That's what makes me a whore and a worshipper of the beast. That's just my study. Sorry, uh, you're smiling. I hope you haven't got dragged on. No, no, no. no. I'm, I'm just strong words for yourself. Like, you know, you're definitely not a whore. You know what I mean? So. No, you know, but I used but, to. But, but here's the thing, though. Here's the thing, though. So mm -hmm. I understand the transition um, that you've had, you know, and I, I appreciate your, your testimony. I think, and this is my opinion. You, there's a lot of concentration on what you used to be. Like you, you, you don't have to. You don't have to state claim to that anymore. You are redeemed from that. And a lot of times, if we continually look back at it, it's stifling. You know, if I look at the stuff I did, you know, before I knew who Yahusha was, constantly, it, it won't allow me to move forward. I wouldn't accept the things that are in my path now. Mm -hmm. So the same way that we 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 seek to have Yah speak to us, and we look for like you were talking earlier about um, sign sound waves and frequencies. You know, there's a frequency in your ear too, reminding mm -hmm. you of who you used to be. And I think part of getting past that is is not so much is is not to mention it or speak on it so much, unless there is a case where you need to, and, and, and for instance, if someone in our fel comes into our fellowship that is dealing with some of those things and then you can speak into their life because we don't have to carry that dead carcass around anymore. We just don't. And, you know, as a, as a brother to a sister, um, you very often refer to it. And I think, you know, it would do you a great service to, to bury it. You know, and, and seek to find out more what Yah wants to do with you going forward. Um, so, oh, yeah, I appreciate that 100%. I was just expressing what I'm seeing whilst I'm speaking to Father now with you guys. This is what I'm seeing. And I see, I don't see the beast and the harlot as some separate entity to anyone. I think all of us have fallen. So, I'm not, you know, all of us have fallen to that state, an animalistic state, all of us the scriptures say all of us have so i'm seeing that transition in this though in as i'm reading this this is what i'm seeing the sign of the mind being i was just expressing here to people that my mind used to be marked that way yeah now it's marked this way but i'm not going to change overnight i need you and i need the, the love and i need to to, to change transition and change but i have a memory of that for, not because I dwell on it or like it has a crutch on me like it used to. I've been there and not any longer. Well, I hope it's not. But uh, if you see something different than I do, then maybe it's, uh, I mean, I pray about it. But, yeah, um, no, we'll, and we'll continue to pray about it. Praise God. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't dwell on it, but I see it when I'm in scripture reading. I can see that going from animal to new and, and I see that transition. I think it's very important for us sometimes to see that. Oh that yeah, yeah. Have changed. It definitely, it definitely is a grounding post, you know. Because if you know anything about electricity, a grounding post will take electricity straight to ground so that it doesn't affect anything. Those thoughts are grounding posts. They go straight to the ground, straight underneath the ground, and buried where they should be. But it's always good to be grounded and know where you came from, but never to fall back and dwell or wallow or be swallowed, you know, up in what we used to be. Because it's it's a it's a it's a device of the of the father that you were talking about to keep you paralyzed, you know, and and it will render you unaffected in the kingdom, you know, and you're a great asset to the kingdom, so praise you for for your testimony. And you know, you know, you said that I can't see what is in your mind. One thing about you, Amy, is that you pretty much express your mind. So, and that's and that's a good thing. Um, so we can see what's in your mind, you know. And I say that jokingly, but I think that's a good thing to have. I think that 
you know, as we become stronger in the faith, we become less likely to hide things that could be of a help and a service to other people. So that's a good trait. Praise y'all, sis. Um, Sister London. Uh, yes, uh, going back to what we were discussing, um, some things in uh, in Torah speaks of it being uh, kept from generation to generation, like Shabbat, the feast, and things of that nature. Some things don't. Things of like frontlets and all of that, you don't hear anything about that. But I just wanted to uh, read what it says pertaining to the fringes and the zitzis. In Numbers 15, uh, 38, speak unto the children of Yahshua, and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations, that they put upon the fringe the border of ribbon of blue, and it shall be unto you for a fringe that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of your Ua and do them, and that you seek not after your own heart and your own ways after which you used to go a whoring that you may remember to do all my commandments and be holy unto your Elohim or Kadash. I am your, or your Elohim, which brought you out. So this appears to be more of a perpetual thing. Whenever I see throughout your generations, it does, I, it's, it's more, it, do you, that's not per perpetual. You don't think that was a perpetual uh, covenant, uh, a commandment? Yeah, I do. I, when, I, when I spoke on Zit Zit's, um, in the physical, I was speaking of there's a greater picture in what they ought to represent. And I was saying how there are many people wearing zit seats that are in sin. So it's not what's what sign is it showing of that okay. particular person? But no, I, I, I'm not saying don't obey that command. I was speaking of the physical okay. versus what it really means to Yah, not don't follow the command that says where's Zit seats. Right, not, not right. right. Yeah. Yeah, praise you. Right, okay. Thank you for that clarity. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, don't. Nah, nowhere am I saying not to obey the command. Um, all right, let's finish out the chapter. So we're in, let's pick up in verse 17. Um, who wants to uh, read? from 17 to 22, to the end of the chapter. Anyone? Go ahead, Amy. I was a bit, because I've spoke quite a lot, so <laughs> as usual. Well, I, I mean, nobody's raising their hand, you know. Oh, yeah, well, I know, so I might as well do it. You can't do everything. So, yeah, first, sure. from verse 18, verse 17. 17. <clears throat> um, do I go to the end? Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Read to the end. Okay. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that Yahweh led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines. Although that was near, Yahweh said, lest per adventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. But Yahweh led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea. And the children of Yashra'al went up harnessed out of the land of Mitzrayim, Egypt. And Masha, Moses, took the bones of Yusuf with him. For he had straightly sworn the children of Yashra'al, saying, Yahweh will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones away hence with you. And they took their journey from Sukkot, or oh, sorry, no, is that right? From Sukkot, yeah, and encamped in Epham, Ephraim, in the edge of the wilderness, and Yahweh went before them by day in a pillar of cloud and led them by the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night 
He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Yeah. So, so the wilderness way, what do we see here? JP got his hand up already. You want to take a crack at anything, Amy, before we move on? The only thing that stands out to me, what I love is in this is the, the, um, the fire and the clouds. I, mm -hmm. I always been praying for a while to, how is the, where's the fire and cloud in the renewed covenant? And obviously we see the Ruach and the immersion of fire in the Ruach. Uh, in the renewed covenant, and that's what I identified: the pillar of cloud by day and night, um, and fire, etc. Even by the the specific ones being a day and a night differentiation, and then you go for the new renewed covenant. You can also see Messiah here in the same play out in a different way. Um, but I also find it interesting that there's 22. Again, me and the numbers. There's just 22 verses in this chapter, and 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 I find that interesting because we were just speaking about the 22 letters. But anyway, that's it, really. Yeah, no. Um, you know, the pillar of fire by day, the cloud. You know, and we know that that's Yahushua himself. You know, leading them. We have the ruach leading us in that same way. You know, they needed a, something physical to guide them, you know, and this is what we see here, and it's clearly outlined in scripture. So um, I'm gonna let G JP go, but I wanted to read you guys something out of Deuteronomy, but go ahead, JP. I, I just wanna mention how this is, um, it says, lest peradventure the people repent when they see um, war, and they returned to Egypt. And um, it was in, like, I mean, from the context, it's like a perfect example of what repentance is. Like, they're going to turn back. They're going to, you know, go away, you know. But when I looked at the word, um, it says, it says it's 5162 Nakam. And it's... Um, the word according to the strongs is to sigh i.e as an example breathe breathe strongly by implication to be sorry right um or avenge you know so it, it's really the opposite of what i was thinking about yeah. you know when i because i initially from the english i'm thinking repentance like oh it's like a perfect example to turn back but really it was like to be comforted when they see this war happening like according to the strongs it says to comfort you know there's another uh, -huh. uh there's another word well in the english they used it as comfort 57 times yeah you no, know what i'm saying yeah that's so so what's going on here is something a little different right so the, the, there was a reason he took them the long way as to not so they wouldn't be faint of heart you know they're they're coming out of Egypt. And we're going to see later, you know, when we're going we're not going to get into chapter 14 this week, but we're going to see when they hear the hoofs and the chariots, you know, they freak out. You know, like I would you should have why did you bring us here? You should have left us, you know. And and we see panic there. Well, he's in the same way he's saying um Elohim did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines. So he took them around it, although it was near. In other words, it was very close to where they had to go to. It was a short trip, but he took them around it so that they would miss it, lest perhaps the people change their minds. So, so, so the repent there is change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. So Elohim led the people around by the way of the wilderness to the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. So, so that leads me to what I wanted to read you guys out of Deuteronomy. So check this out, Deuteronomy chapter eight. It says, every commandment, verse one, which I command you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go and process the land of which 
Yahuwah swore to your fathers, and you shall remember that Yahuwah, your Elohim, led you all the way these 40 years, right? This was a short trip. It wasn't a long trip, but it took them 40 years to go an eight days journey. Why? It says, led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness, one, to humble you and to test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So this is a, this is a 40 year workout plan to get them prepared to follow Yah. This was a, this was purposeful, right? Um, so he humbled you, allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know the man shall not know that man shall not live by bread alone, but, but lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of Yahuwah. Yahushua quoted this to, 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 to the enemy, right? Your garments did not wear out. Where are those clothes at? What kind of clothes did they have that didn't wear out for 40 years? Nor did your foot swell these 40 years. What kind of sneakers were there? Were those that our that parents, I'm sure you would love to buy your kids, that never wear out, right? Um, you should know in your heart that as a man chastened his son, so Yahuwah your Elohim chastens you. Verse six, therefore you shall keep the commandments of Yahuwah your Elohim to walk in his ways to fear him. For Yahuwah your Elohim is bringing you into a good land, Amy, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains and springs that flow out of the valleys and hills, flowing with milk and honey, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil, olive oil, olive oil, and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. When you have eaten and are full, you shall bless Yahuwah, your Elohim, for the good land which he has given you. So this is what I was speaking of about the abundance of the land when it spoke of the land of milk and honey. So, so we clearly see that the reason he leads them is because so they wouldn't have faint of heart, so he can build them up and strengthen them to the point where he could allow them then to face war because they weren't ready at that point. So um, it wasn't you know, necessarily, um, but, in, but in the terms that you use in comfort, JP, you can see how it was comforting for him to take them through this. Because if he did not do this, they would not have been comforted. They would have lost their minds, you know, in, in having to fight as they're leaving uh, slavery. So, all right, Sister Robbie, then Sister Linda. Shabbat shalom, sis. Sister Robbie. All right. Sister Linda. Okay. Um, I just wanted to mention this pillar, the pillar of cloud, the pillar of, of, of fire. All the, all the time, my image of these things, when I would think about these things over the years, when I would read the scripture, was a cloud or a fire. But now I'm looking at it a little closer now, this word pillar, 5982, in the uh, uh, concordance, it means it's a, like a stand or a platform, a column. So what did this thing, what kind of, image was this of a cloud made of a cloud and made of fire 
but it was a pillar. All of this was very supernatural. You know, from an English perspective, a pillar is like a tall vertical structure used to, you know, support like a building or a monument or something like that. But this clearly is not just a typical cloud or a typical flame of fire. This was some tall uh, manifestation that was able to lead them continuously uh, like that, that was very visible uh, for them. Do you have any insight on the pillar? Or have you heard anything over the years of uh, what exactly this pillar looked like or whatever? Um, nah, I mean, I mean, I've seen pictures of, of what people imagined it would be. I mean, I don't know how we would know. Um, but it was, it was something visible that they could see that would guide them in the direction that they were going. Um, that's the only explanation that I have. Um, anyone else can definitely chime in, but that's, that's all that I know. <clears throat> I have no idea what it actually looked like though. Sister Robbie. You there, sis? She must be having some type of audio issues. Sister Poppy. I'm back in the theological workbook of the Old Testament, looking up the pillar word. Okay. And it says the very common noun used 110 times in the Old Testament, used of pillars supporting buildings, bronze pillars of the temple, and the pillar of the cloud and fire, and Yaz Theophany. I don't know that I pronounced that right. But it seems to maintain the same physical concept as what's used in the temple and holding a building, so just probably a lot bigger. Just my thoughts. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't have any, any, um, yeah, I mean, I know what a pillar looks like know what a pillar of fire would look like but i don't i don't know um other than what it what it the, the visible instruction that it gives you know what it look like other than it being a guiding light for them you know it being a guiding symbol in the air during the day for them to follow so um but yeah thanks for that sis um amy I was just saying if there was a um a co connection went with um the cloud and the, the pillar of fire um obviously it's clearly I, well I was just praying about it now and 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 you know in the renewed covenant well the new covenant when it says we we shall be immersed by Yahusha by the ruach and fire so they're the two words that are used of of an immersion um different to the one that um. Yohanan did, which was the water. Then we have obviously here we have ruach and fire mentioned. And I was wondering if um maybe there's a connection between the cloud and fire being the the cloud representing the ruach and the fire representing the same fire that obviously is spoken of in the New Testament. Um the reason being obviously because the word ruach is breath, obviously that's what it means, breath. Um, and so the cloud could obviously represent maybe that side of things, the, the Ruach side. Because um, it's interesting, it speaks about day and night as well. So one's in the day and one's in the night. And um, I'm recognizing that as well um, when Messiah speaks about day and night quite a lot as well in his teachings. Um, you know, because the distinctive, the difference, and so you know, we have the the breath, which is um, they say, 
um, he uses a, forgive me, I'm just going to uh, go over it and see. He says the, is it the, the, is the cloud by day or, and the, or is the fire by day and the cloud by night, is it? Sorry, forgive me, I'm trying to find you. The cloud by day, I can't, yeah, so the, 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 the pillar of fire was by night and the cloud was by day. I find that very, um, a reasonable, there's a distinction there to why it's addressing the day and the night and, and, and I'm seeing if there's a correlation for us to look into more um, about the Ruach and fire that's mentioned in scripture in the New Testament. And if there's a distinctive mention of day and night time there as well to the leaving out of the people, because it's a deliverance that's going on. And we know Messiah, you said before, rep the Ruach and fire represents Messiah delivering, showing us the way of deliverance, or showing us the way out. And I'm just wondering, maybe the cloud represents the breath. Who knows where that passage is where, where it says, um, Yahushua, I think it's in the first or second Corinthians where it says Yahushua was the pillar of cloud by day and by oh, wow. night that led the Israelites out of the wilderness. Oh, wow. I've never read that. That'd be cool if someone knows where that is. I don't know if it's the uh, first Corinthians chapter 10. Yeah, that's what I was looking at. Uh, it's 10. I mean, I mean, it doesn't one, really. I mean, one of my reading, scholars. Can, my scholars. Check it out, check it out. Where's that? <laughs> check it out. First Corinthians chapter ten, um, from one to like four, but it's like a little section of, of talking yeah, yeah, about. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Moreover, brethren, yes. I do not want you to be unaware that our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank um, that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Messiah. So. Uh, um, yeah, that's what I, well, that's interesting. That's what I was actually seeing in. In the Exodus, I was seeing an immersion going on, and that's basically like what you just said. There's a, yeah. It is an immersion. They they're actually being immersed right now. In in this. <clears throat> that's what I'm seeing, and an actual um, an immersion, the immersion that needed to be done, the the one because we know we have an. I'm not saying water immersion is not needed. It is, but we know that there's a greater immersion according to scripture, and this is obviously a great Exodus immersion that synchronizes with the exodus of Messiah and the people as well, him amazing them. Well, that's the passage. Thank you, uh, um, JP. Um, that is the passage I was looking for because in each instance it says all, mm -hmm. and then it culminates and said they all drank of the same spiritual drink for they all drank, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Yahushua. So, you know, um, I believe that that's what, it, that's what it's saying, that that was Yahushua leading them. So, um, well, I could be wrong, but that's, that's the passage I was looking for. What do you guys think? No, no, I agree. Um, I see an evasion. <laughs> you don't want to say it on the recording? <laughs> uh, no, no. I I think that. I mean, you know, it's it's kind of not like stated, but I look at it as it is stated. You know what I mean? In context wise, you know, because some yeah. people want to see it plainly stated, like, oh, right. it doesn't say it, but it's like, right. but to me, it, it is in context speaking that Yahusha was the rock that they drank from, he was the meat, it was like he was the cloud, he was he was all to encompass them, to sure. direct and guide them, yeah, so. <laughs> but it, it's just one of those areas, you know, some people they wanna see, like I say, like a plain statement, so that they're like, oh no, it doesn't say that, but you're like, look, just take the context and understanding that we're given here to be shown, and I, and I believe that you're on the right 
to me, you're on the right point with that. Right. Well, I mean, in the, in the context is the, 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 you know, of Messiah being examples of him being in the Old Testament. You know what I mean? That, that, that's the context of it. So, you know, I, I say it's all him, you know. Who else could it be? <laughs> you know? So. And, and, um, and, just to, and just to add real quick is um, I've been hanging on to this verse for, for, since we read, finished the book of Acts. But Acts 28 verse 23 says, and when they had appointed him a day, speaking about Paul, there came many to him into his lodging to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of Elohim, persuading them concerning Yahusha, both out of the law of Moses or the Torah of Moses, and out of the prophets from morning till evening. And I love that. It's just been stuck with me since we finished the book of Acts, that how yeah. beautiful that is, that Paul is expounding, testifying, and showing who Yahusha was from the Torah and from the prophets. That's so, all he had. That, that's all he had. That's all he had. See, and, see here's, here's the thing with that. And, and it's, it's one of the things that I point to when I'm talking to my Christian brothers and sisters is that they're, they're trying to make, you know, the Brit Hadashah be something new and, 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 and severed from the old. And what they don't realize is that everything that they were studying and quoting from was the Tanakh. There was no New Testament. The compiling of the letters that we're reading were compiled later. So, so, so they're missing the point and understanding exactly what it says at the end of Acts. He's showing them who Messiah was in the Tanakh. You know what I mean? He's showing examples, you know, that, and that's what he's doing in 1 Corinthians 10. You know, so, so that was my point of reference. Um, and and the, 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 the point of, of um, the subject and trying to find out, okay, what does this pillar of fire, what is this cloud, you know? It's Yahushua, you know what I mean? So that's a great passage in Acts, man. And uh, <clears throat> it should be a part of any explanation in trying to um, get people to understand that everything is foundational in Torah. And like, you can't separate it. If you're not following Torah, what are you following? Like, what, 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 what faith do you have? Like, if you just take the New Testament, like, what is it founded on? Tell me that. Tell me what it's founded on, and then I can understand what you're saying. You know? And, and the only way to, to have a foundation other than Torah is to come up with what they believe, you know, and what we used to believe, you know, to connect Torah to it, obliviates that thought process, you know, and points you to the full understanding of what it's saying. You know, when, when explaining to someone that <clears throat> when it talks about in the New Testament about food being sanctified, nowhere in the New Testament is it sanctified. It's sanctified in Leviticus, go back. That's where he sanctifies what's clean and what's not. That's the sanctification, you know? It doesn't change from that, you know? You know, these passages that they try to find don't say what they think they're saying because they're not using Torah as their foundation. So good stuff, people. Um, Sister Linda, and then we'll close out. Yes, I was just going to add that, um Transfiguration was, um, uh, uh, they appeared in a cloud. When he left, when Yahushua left, he left in a cloud. When he come back, he's coming back in a cloud. In the ancient of days of uh, uh, division in uh, Daniels, he was in a cloud. And also, um, there's a scripture that tells us that when we meet him, we're going to be caught up in a cloud. Right. The clear, the distinction is what is a cloud. And I think that takes us to the next level on of discussion the next time uh, we come together, but it's clearly, and the things that uh, ACS Amy said with the, um, those are definitely uh, the cloud and the fire, all of that is definitely a part of the Ruach HaKadosh also. The only thing we was trying to establish was what is a pillar, because in this particular case, it says Ahmad, uh, it, it comes from the root Ahmad, that means to stand. So I'm trying to see what type of platform 
since Poppy um, uh, uh, pretty much like defined it also from an ancient perspective also, all of the input was so very, uh, very clear and good. And I think we have a better understanding of it now. Praise you Praise you Thank you. <clears throat> all right. Well, this concludes our Exodus chapter 13 study. Um, what a great study it was. Some of it was kind of learning on the fly. Um, some passages that we either didn't understand or maybe read through without seeking to know what they meant. Um, and, and this is the way we study. So we hope that uh, everyone was Baruch by the study. And uh, read ahead. We'll be in chapter 14 next week. Praise Yah and uh, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shalom, Akuti, and Rohim. Thank you so much for viewing this video. We hope it was helpful to your walk in the truth. Remember to always search the scriptures on your own, to study Abba's word, and show yourself approved according to 2 Timothy 2.15. We invite you to study with us. To join us in a live study, just go to our website, at assemblyofyahuwah.com and click the Join Us tab. We have something available Wednesday through Saturday of every week. If you've been Baruch or blessed by this video today or any other study, we encourage you to go to the Giving tab on our website. Our elders all have their own ways of income, so none of the giving or proceeds go to them. Instead, it goes to biblical assembly needs. We also encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you don't miss any new videos. We sincerely pray that Abba continues to direct your path as you acknowledge Him in all your ways. Much avaha and again shalom.